There are an enormous number of aspects of um, modernist culture, the culture of the last hundred years or so, um, which simulate schizophrenia. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ian McGilchrist, um, psychiatrist and author of The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, here to AEI. Uh, Dr. McGilchrist holds multiple fellowships at Oxford University, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the, and the Royal Society of Arts. So welcome, Ian. It's good to have you. Thank you very much, Brent. So I hear from others that one question authors don't usually get asked when they come on to a program like this is, what's your book about? So why don't you start there and, and give us a little bit of what your book is about. Well, it's about the vexed uh, topic of the difference between the brain hemispheres, um, a topic that has become rather uh, a toxic topic because of its exploitation by um, media people and uh, pop psychology. Mm. Uh, and it started with things that we learnt, uh, well it took off let me say, because we learnt differences about the brain hemispheres in the 19th century, but it really took off after um, the first split brain operations in Caltech in the 1960s, where the brain was divided, this was for treatment of intractable epilepsy, and it gave people an insight into what the brains, the two halves of the brain might do that were different. And out of that came a number of ideas that eventually were proved to be wrong. They were, for example, that the left hemisphere does language and reason and the right hemisphere does emotion and pictures. And with further research, it was found that in fact, both hemispheres were involved with everything. But in a, 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 that was a bit that we didn't notice was that they are involved consistently in two entirely different ways. And the subject had fallen into disrepute because we were only asking the machine question, what does it do? And we're finding that they're both involved in doing everything. But the question, the more human question, and after all the brain is part of a person, in what way do they do, was not being asked. But if you ask that question, you get a fascinating series of answers. And my book is really expounding what those differences are between the two brain hemispheres and what influence that might have on, on the history of culture, including and specifically our own culture now. You talk about uh, the right hemisphere of the brain as being the master. Yes. And you talk about the left hemisphere as being the emissary. Yes. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, the image comes from a, a story of a wise spiritual master who looked after a community so well that it flourished and grew. And after a while, he d discovered that he not only couldn't look after everything that was needed by this, the, these people, this community, but that importantly, he couldn't be involved in certain things if he was to maintain his overview. So he delegated that job of going about and doing certain quite specific detailed administrative tasks to his brightest and best servant. The trouble with this guy was that he was bright, but not bright enough to know what it was he didn't know. And so he thought, I know everything. What does a master know? He doesn't know anything. He's sitting back there, smiling seraphically back at, at base. He, he doesn't know anything. I'm the one that does all the heavy lifting. I really understand. The trouble is, he didn't know what it was he didn't know. He didn't know what it was the master knew. The master knew he needed the emissary, the emissary didn't know he needed the master. And this led to the collapse of the community, and, and this is a parable. Uh, the parable, I think, applies to the relationship between the two neuronal systems, the two hemispheres. One has a broad view, which includes the need for a detailed view. It has a global view that sees the need for certain quite specific facts and data. The other hemisphere, and this is the left hemisphere, sees only the details, but has no concept that it's missing the big picture. It thinks that maybe you can put all these details together and they'll compose the big picture. But actually it's not like that. We think and the left hemisphere can't see that it could be otherwise, that a whole is simply made by putting together the parts. 
but actually the whole of many things as we appreciate in living is not the same as what you get when you take it apart into a handful of pieces. And so you've used some interesting examples in the past about uh, this from the animal kingdom. Yes. And, and how you sort of, how the penny dropped as it were when you started yes. studying animal um, behavior. Uh, and uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that yeah. helps to explain under the, this left-right yes. hemisphere distinction. Yes. Well, it's not just human beings that have lateralized brains. In, in other words, that have two halves of the brain that are not symmetrical. By the way, they're not symmetrical in anything you can measure, mm -hmm. uh, anatomically or physiologically, so functionally, structurally, they are different, mm -hmm. reliably so. But this is not just about humans, it's not even about apes, it's not even about mammals, or reptiles, or amphibians, or fish, or insects, or nematode worms. <laughs> Every existing living thing that we know that has any kind of neuronal structure at all has an asymmetrical one. Mm -hmm. and that, leads to the question, why? Um, and there is an answer to this, uh, which uh, gradually dawned on me, which is that it has an important evolutionary significance. That is, that it solves a conundrum, how to eat and stay alive. Now that doesn't sound like a conundrum to us now, but for most animals, it's a dangerous business uh, being focused on one thing, because you're obviously not looking at everything else. So while you're focusing on catching that rabbit, picking out that seed against a background of grit, you know, picking up a twig to build a nest, you've got to have very sharply focused attention, just very narrow beam attention to a detail. But if that's the only attention you're paying, you'll soon become somebody else's lunch while you're getting your own because you need to have a sustained vigilance for predators, for conspecifics, for others that are around, and for everything else, basically, that is going on in the world. And when you observe animals and birds, what you find is that the left hemisphere serves the predator instinct in which you go for some detail, and therefore is good for manipulating the world. But it's not terribly clever. It doesn't really see the whole picture. It doesn't understand what it's doing. But it's a servant. It's a very good servant. The right hemisphere, meanwhile, is understanding the whole thing and saying, I see where this thing of getting my lunch and getting that twig for the, how that fits into the whole. And what I am suggesting is that in the way in which we now think, we've got locked on to a rather unintelligent way of thinking that enables you to be very efficient at grasping, but not very efficient at understanding. And if you think about it, the left hemisphere is the part of your brain that controls your right hand, which is the one with which you do all the grasping. And it's, it's the one that controls the bits of language, not all of language, but the bits that enable you to say, oh, I've grasped it. In other words, you've got some little certain factoid. <laughs> but the problem is, you try to live a wise life on the basis of putting a lot of these together, and you simply can't. You've covered pretty well for us the, um, the scientific side of this, but that's only half of your book. Um, the second half of your book is really devoted to an analysis, a cultural analysis, historical analysis. Um, and I'd like you to unpack that a little bit, um, you know, in terms of what your research, what you think your research tells us about the development of the West, Western civilization. The trigger for this came from um, a book by a, a distinguished colleague called Louis Sass, who wrote a book called Madness and Modernism. And it, effectively what that book demonstrated was that there are an enormous number of aspects of uh, modernist culture, the culture of the last hundred years or so, um, which simulate schizophrenia. In other words, people who suffer from schizophrenia describe experiences, depict phenomena that are extraordinarily like those that are in the mainstream of modernism. Now that was a, a and, and he, uh, over 500 pages, he shows this time and time again in, in great detail. It's very convincing. For example, many of the movements in the visual arts in the last hundred years exemplify various phenomena of distorted vision, which are found in people with right hemisphere damage. So some of the actual movements that became popular uh, exemplified phenomena that until now have been quite peculiar to people with uh, schizophrenia. 
Um, and you see this also in, uh, for example, the literature, where a deliberate effect of sense of alienation, that perhaps other people are machines, they're not really living, but they're almost like sort of terrifying zombies, or the sense that you yourself are cut off uh, and unable to feel for anything, um, the distortion of perspective, the um, deliberate disruption of narrative, which has been part of the way in which novels have been written that periods during the last hundred years, um, the, the willingness to strip things away from context and deliberately make them seem strange or odd, creates an effect which um, is awfully like um, the experiences that people with schizophrenia describe. They seem to be experiencing something that modernist artists, writers and even philosophers um, seem to be tackling which is this kind of devitalization, this alienation, this disembodiment, this mechanization and so forth, which comes out in the art and culture. So the question is why? Um, and I, this struck me like a thunderbolt because I'd been researching at Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore um, on asymmetries in the brain of people with schizophrenia. And what I had learned, amongst many other things, apart from the fact that their brains are not asymmetrical in the way that ours are, is that people with schizophrenia are awfully like people with right hemisphere brain damage. People with right hemisphere strokes or tumors or injuries experience things, describe things, depict things in the way that people with schizophrenia do, broadly. I mean, there are differences, but that's a, a, a very substantial uh, similarity. And so, what I took from this was that it wasn't that we were all becoming schizophrenic, but that maybe we were not utilizing what our right hemispheres tell us. We were listening only to what our left hemispheres tell us. And I looked at that for quite a long time and saw masses of evidence that this seemed to hold up. And I then thought, well, if, we, if that's the case, and in the past we've had you know, different kinds of culture, there have been many movements in the history of ideas in the West, they presumably weren't all so skewed in this way. And I looked at the uh, ancient Greek civilization, at the Roman civilization, and at our own modern civilization, starting with the Renaissance and moving forwards through big movements like the Reformation, the Enlightenment, Romanticism, Modernism and Postmodernism. And uh, to abbreviate a, a, a much longer story, um, effectively what I saw there was the same shape repeated. And that shape goes like this. At the beginning of a civilization, it seems suddenly to erupt with a great efflorescence of ideas, thoughts, creative uh, material in, in, in poetry, in drama, in, in history making, in the writing of myths, in the exploration of the seas, the stars, the, the use of mathematics, even the beginnings of engineering. And these things then over time, which are so effective and so flourishing, quite soon over a period of usually about four or 500 years deteriorate in a recognizable way. The society becomes more rigid, it becomes more steeply hierarchical, it becomes more bureaucratic, it becomes more interested in control and power than it is in actually imagination, which requires that you make yourself vulnerable in certain ways. And it simply can't afford to do this. And the Greeks overreached themselves with their civilization, the Romans did the same, and they collapsed. Now, in our own case, I believe that we're following the same path, that we were very rich in creativity for a few hundred years, and that the, in the last, certainly particularly the last 150 years, there has been an overemphasis on domination, getting, empire, first notably the British, and then more in a commercial sense, the Americans, and cultural domination, in which I think, a very diminished sort of bureaucratic, necessarily so, because when you've got an empire, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to be em emphasizing the military and the bureaucracy and the administration. It has to be managed. It has to be managed. And so management think, which to me is uh, 
the death of imagination <laughs> um, becomes the, if you like, the way in which everything is interpreted. It's interpreted as essentially knowable, quantitative, objective, and essentially dead. Whereas in fact, everything we experience is changing, animate, and multiply connected to everything else we know. So one living, animate, changing, uh, pleasantly, uh, constantly leading one beyond the horizons of what one knows now, that kind of a world gets eliminated in favour of a dead, static, contained, and knowable nothing. That's where we're at. Well, that's a little daunting. Um, so tell me how you see, just to build on that a bit, uh, for the average person who's thinking about what you're saying, what would you point to as evidence of this um, overworking, I guess, of the left hemisphere in our, in our society around us? How does it manifest itself? Well, uh, I don't know what it's like in America, but if you try dealing with any administrative body, um, even with your bank or the telephone company, you find yourself pushed down an algorithm that doesn't have anything to do with your circumstances. <laughs> and it's over control. Um, people who are not, as it were, trained or educated to the point where they can think for themselves are dealing with this as a new situation. Instead, they have a repertoire of stale, abstracted situations which they are told to handle in certain predicted ways. And unfortunately, life is never like that and almost never can be solved in that way. So, I mean, its problems can't be solved in that way. So this is something that I imagine we all have experience of. Also, our educational system has, in my lifetime, gone from being something which encouraged free thinking. In fact, the purpose of it was to encourage people to think differently, to question the, the uh, um, whatever the um, received thinking of the age was. Um, also to learn hard a lot of the things about the past, which would help you to interpret the present and give a context to it. Um, nowadays, people are not interested in and don't learn about the past. They're over-technically educated and under-humanistically educated. They don't actually know much about history, which is, after all, the sum of human experience so far. They don't, they're not encouraged to examine imaginatively literature, which enables you to get into other worlds than the, the, than the one we now live in. I mean, the whole point of education is not to be relevant. The worst possible thing is to say, it must be relevant. What that means is it's got to replicate whatever it is we're stuck in now. But the point of education is to break out of what we're stuck in now. And so <laughs> that's, the, that's the error. And if you now, I mean, I used to teach literature, and one of the marvelous things about it is that great literature is absolutely unique, impossible to re rephrase as a, a bunch of ideas. It just has a powerful effect on you as an embodied being, you know? And then now, I mean, I have a, a daughter who studied English, and I mean, what she studied was, first of all, very little of what I would call the canon, um, which is now considered to be somehow irrelevant. But actually, without it, you can't understand where we are now. Right. If you don't understand history, you don't understand where you are. Right. It's like trying to abstract yourself from space and say, where am I? And you, you delete all the all the places around, you don't know where you are or what you're doing. So she, that happened. And then, of course, the attitude is to be superior to the work because you now have information and a point of view that this poor sucker who wrote this play or novel in the past didn't have. So we now take him off. Oh, he was a racist and a sexist and a, and a whatever. And we never actually make contact with the thing as a living thing that is speaking to us imaginatively. I mean, this is terrible. So, I mean, I think all of us have um, been, uh, all of us have, you know, kind of deep concerns about the nature of uh, public discourse yeah. today. Yeah. Um, you know, the inability, the, the lack of empathy, the lack of imagination and creativity and problem solving and, and things like that. Do you think that's a function of this uh, phenomenon? Well, I think this phenomenon, if I'm right, that we are uh, 
trained to disattend to things that are not explicit and that are not in the foreground. And actually all the interest is going on in the background, the context, the implicit. If, that, if I'm right, and we're mainly focused on grabbing the obvious, then we would be living in a materialist society that didn't value um, spiritual things which simply can't be measured and can't be proved. It would um, tend to uh, prefer technical matters that can be measured to those that are um, creative. Um, it would tend to stultify the intellect. And I think that is what is happening. And people aren't trained to think critically about their own opinions. So you get, you know, when I was at school, I was taught the purpose of an education is to be able to give graded consent or graded dissent to any proposition. <laughs> and I believe there is nothing so good that more and more and more of it is just better. And there is nothing so bad that a little bit of it might not do some good. And if you accept that, and I think it's hard not to, then it's, the discussion has to be about where we should position ourselves on this continuum. That is not had as a discussion because people are polarized. The left hemisphere tends to be extremely crude and black and white and sets up oppositions. The right hemisphere is better at seeing that things that look like opposites may cohere. They may actually need one another and coexist. Mm. But I'd like to say that one of the most important things in which um, our younger people can see the fruits of this way of thinking are all around us in the what we know about the destruction of the natural world, um, the destruction of species, the poisoning of the seas, the deforestation of the, of, of the earth, um, in the tendency to uh, grab resources at the expense of, say, whole indigenous peoples that get wiped out, um, and the over-control of all lives through um, monitoring of every kind, uh, DNA databases, CCTV cameras, um, monitoring your online movements and so forth. And this is, has become a totalitarian nightmare already in China. And I worry about this being exported here. There are already signs that it is actually happening here. It is happening here, and it, but it's interesting because it's coming through the private sector rather than the government. Yeah, um, no, that's uh, right. Uh, as, no, completely, um, yeah. As Can I talk about predicting? Yes, please, go yeah, right yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, do you know about predictive? No, please no, tell okay. us about it. Okay. Well, you know, in, in China, they have this uh, social credit system yes. whereby everything you do is monitored and evaluated. And if you talk to the wrong person or voice the wrong opinion or buy the wrong thing in a store, this counts against you. And if you get enough black points, you, bad points, you can't actually get a job or, or, or take a loan or, or, or even move from your town because you can't buy a train ticket. Well, Believe it or not, in America, there is a private company called Predictim that has developed an algorithm. And these things always start as for your own protection, you know, how everything sinister gets in to make things safer. And this one is about how can you get safer than this babysitting? Oh, every, that really speaks to the core because everybody wants to protect their child. So there is an algorithm that will tell you whether a babysitter is reliable. And how does it do that? It monitors your Facebook page and your Instagram posts and everything that they can find out about the websites that you visit. And it looks at your face and your facial expressions and movements and records your opinions. And it can't tell the difference between a, a funny remark, a sarcastic remark, a remark out of context or anything else. And it creates a score a mindless score that even the people who created it don't know where it gets the data from. And you, the victim of this, don't know why you're getting a bad score. And that would perhaps not matter very much if it only happened if you were babysitting. But now companies are using predictive data to hire people. So if you've got, like you voiced um, an opinion that was controversial, you're marked down as a troublemaker. But a society needs people who are going to be a little bit rebellious. Right, right, wow. Okay, um, so let's wrap up on this question. Um, if, uh, as you say, this problem of uh, left hemisphere dominance has occurred in the past, um, why should we worry about it? Uh, you know, won't it, won't it just correct itself over time the way it has in the past? Well, the last time um, a civilization collapsed in the West, it took a thousand years for one to reemerge. Mm. Um, so that would be concerning, but not very. 
But the thing is that um, in the late Roman Empire, they were able to commit suicide as a, as a civilization, but they weren't able actually physically to destroy the means of life. But we now have accelerating power, um, logarithmically accelerating power. And technology is a wonderful thing if you're wise enough to know how to use it. But every technology can be used for good or ill. And it's only a matter of time before that immense power falls into the hands of people whose desires are not good, not ones we would appreciate. And so at the same time that society faces the possibility of a totalitarian regime, quite quickly amassing an enormous amount of data such that you know, it just dwarfs anything the Soviet system ever thought of, that can happen. It can happen in the West. You know, people say it couldn't happen here. That's nonsense. Democracy is a fragile flower mm -hmm. and it can easily be trampled on. And, you know, we saw totalitarian regimes arise in places like Germany and Italy in the last century, places with a long civilized history. So that can happen. And the other thing that I'm talking about is, which seems to me the most serious thing of all, is that I think there is good evidence that climate change has now got to the point where it is irreversible. And the consequences of this mean that there will be changes in the way in which people can inhabit certain parts of the world. In other words, there'll be mass migrations of populations away from areas of drought and famine. And these will be so large that they can't be policed or resisted and there will be a breakdown in civil order. Now, if that happens, civ this civilization will end. And it may be not just a matter of a thousand years, but if the planet is properly despoiled, it may be much, much longer. The planet will survive. People say, let's save the planet. I would say the planet is amazingly resilient. The planet has been through many, many things. It's human beings that are fragile. And the planet will survive, but we won't be there to see it. And I happen to think that's a great shame. Dr. McGill, Chris, it's been a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. Hi, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Ian McGilchrist. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about how our brains pay attention to the world, check out the links in the description below.